Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for a very special edition of the show. I'm here with Ted Edwards of Freemark Abbey. Uh, he's been kind enough to sit down with me for a little bit. We just finished doing a tour of the facility um, and talk about the winery. And this is the first of uh, quite a few episodes here in Napa um, and Sonoma. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, everyone's been so kind so far. I had a little bit of freestyling yesterday with a few wineries and just to go and taste and hang out. Um, but today starts the first day of, of getting down, doing some serious interviews. And uh, before we start, I want to give a shout out to John Allen, a former employee of mine of uh, one of the places I worked at and uh, wish him the best of luck. All right, so, because um, he asked me for a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we've got a few wines to taste here, but Ted, you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit and I kind of wanted to, uh, Tell us who you are and kind of how you got into the industry, and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Okay. Well, first of all, Mark, thank you for visiting me. Um, appreciate it. It's always nice, especially after harvest. Got a right. little downtime and a little right. breather, and it's kind of fun to go back and reflect and taste some of these, these wines that are already made in the bottle. Okay. Um, now, my story is I came to Fremark Abbey in 1980 as the assistant winemaker um, out of Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, I was raised in Sebastopol over in Sonoma County and um, I was a biology kind of guy um, you know I decided uh, that uh, winemaking could be a good vocation for me and after 34 plus years I, I think it is <laughs> I good yeah and, so, right? and I'm still having a good, <laughs> I'm still having a good time right so I'm not gonna quit anytime soon um, cut my teeth here at Fremark Abbey working for the salt of the earth uh, people Mm -hmm. uh, the partners that started it up in 1967. It was an old ghost winery, and back then there was 10, 12 wineries in the valley. Today, as you know, there's over 400. Mm -hmm. So phenomenal growth, and these guys were pioneers. They were the salt of the earth, and, and we really clicked, and we really um, had some fun over the years. Um, and uh, in fact, we're going to be tasting the 2001 Cabernet. Nice. That um, they were part of the stewards of that. Good. And. Um, <clears throat> So then it was a grain partnership and the families decided to sell and then there was an interim ownership that uh, wanted me to stay on um, and, and, and they had some difficulties with the, their business model. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's when the Jackson family purchased us in 2006. Very nice. Uh, so, we're, so we're kind of a renaissance winery. Um, we're, uh, we, over the years we have been known for uh, Chardonnay and Cabernets. Mm -hmm. And in today's world, we're really known for cowardice. Right. Very nice. Um, and when did the winery actually start? Well, how, like back in the 1800s? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, back in 1886, again, a pioneering right. winery, as you can imagine, in the 1800s, um, Josephine Tixon, um, a woman, uh, arguably the first woman vintner in California's history, started up Fremark Abbey. And it was called Tixon Cellars at the time. And uh, she sold in the um, 1890s to her cellar foreman, Anton Forney, and he's the one that actually built the stone cellar. So for people that come out to visit us now, they're gonna see a, a stone cellar that was started in 1898. Mm -hmm. Took them um, basically eight years to, to build it. Okay. Uh, they used, um, uh, they, they quarried the stone from the local mountains here okay. and used Italian immigrants to uh, Stone masons to, to build it, right? Um, and it's very solid. It's gone through several earthquakes, right? Uh, and most recently, the August twenty uh, fourth earthquake that right. we had here. Um, so uh, he worked it until um, prohibition, okay? And then uh, and then it sold and had different owners. And as far as we know, 
Well, the official story was nothing happened here. But, right. <laughs> but some of the old timers said, oh, yeah, they made wine there, you know. Right. Kind yeah. Of, uh, but um, it was in 1939 that three business partners, Charles Freeman, Mark Foster, so they took that free Mark, mm -hmm. and then their business partner, Abby Ahern. So free Mark, Abby. Right. To make, so that's where they came from, 1939. Uh, a lot of people out there think it's an abbey. They think I'm one of the monks. <laughs> right. But I have to tell them, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, not one of the monks. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I'll take your confession if you want to give it to me. But uh, anyway, no, um, they worked it until, uh, I, th I believe um, Abby passed away in 1955. Okay. And uh, so they closed their doors. And so then it was dormant until 1967 when, when the modern day era started for Fremark Abbey. Mm hmm Cool. And then, um, so you were telling me in how you got into wine, um, really interesting story, how you kind of got into wine, what, what kind of sparked that? Yeah, you know, well, I was always raised in agriculture, um, and I was a biology kind of guy. My, um, my dad raised apples, and, um, and he used to take me as a kid uh, into uh, the subterranean cellars. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was actually in Colorado, so this was grammar school for me. And I just remember going into the subterranean uh, cellar where they did cold storage of apples. And you'd walk in there and the smell of apples right. and earth and all that, you know, just kind of gives me goosebumps to even think about it. Today. Right. Um, and then he sold his, uh, um, that, that farm and they moved to, to Sebastopol. And that's where I went to high school and, and then, you know, the rest is history. But, um, I used to tag along. So come in out here, um, they would take, uh, they'd go visit wineries, and uh, it was um, uh, um, kind of an epiphany, I guess, or, you know, it's one of those things where you'd wa I'd walk into a winery with them, into the cellar, and all of a sudden, that memory, that smell right. of decaying fruit, mm -hmm. basically wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. Grapes, and the earth and all that kind of stuff. Um, was just fantastic, right? Uh, you know, so so I loved it, and I love and I love the smell of wine and in um, wineries and the oak and all that kind of stuff, all those rich aromas. Mm -hmm. uh, so going to school, I was a biology kind of guy. I went uh, did well in chemistry and microbiology. Took some classes in in wine production, and I thought, hey, I'm going to give this a try. Right? Yeah. So that was the late seventies. And um, you know, got my degree and came out into the world and started started working. And like I said, it's been a great vocation for me. Right. Well, that that's awesome. Um, you know, like you talk about the smell. Like when we got up here and, and we were driving around yesterday, even a little bit today, you know, you could still you could smell the the fermentation going on. Yeah. Because um, there's definitely some stuff still happening. I mean, you know, some people's fermentations are pretty much done. Other people they're still doing it. And uh, I remarked to my father that. Um, that that smell to me is a lot more pleasant than the fermenting of, of beer. Um, uh -huh. Even though I love beer, I love drinking the beer. Right, right. Um, just, you know, you go into the brewery and that smell is just a lot more sour rather right. than, yeah. you know, rather than the wine. It's just, it's just I, I just enjoy the, uh, enjoy it. You know, I kind of the, um, I love the smell of fermenting grapes in the morning instead of, um, what was it, uh, night, night, night palm, whatever the ap ap apocalypse now line, whatever uh -huh. that was. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I'd rather have that smell for Love sure. That smell in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, it's been it's been uh, 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 an incredible trip so far for us, and uh, um, you know, I agree that that smell is is much is very pleasant, mm -hmm. um, especially compared to you know the other type of fermentation I've smelled, which is beer. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes beer you can get some rose petals, but uh, by and large, it's hard to compete with wine because wine you're going to have the cherries, the berries, mm -hmm. right, blackberry. A lot of that, you know, floral kind of thing right. going on, um, which is fantastic. Exactly. Um, well, let's let's kind of get into the wine. Um, so we've got four wines here that we're going to be trying, um, and just kind of take me through what what we're going to be doing here. Okay. Well, first of all, we're going to uh, taste the Chardonnay. Okay. Yeah, and Fremark Abbey, uh, we've been doing a Chardonnay since 1967. Okay. And our style has been one where. Uh, we do not do that secondary fermentation called the malolactic. Okay. Um, in, in my philosophy here is that, um, you know, in the Napa Valley, we're relatively warm. You know, right. we're, it's more Mediterranean. It's not like 
cold Russian river or, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't need the malolactic to soften the acidity or try to build up complexity. I get plenty of ripeness, uh, you know, so why not put that ripeness, that ripe fruit forward? You okay. know? And I, I think this is a gr classic example of Chardonnay for people that want, like if you're teaching a class, you right. want to show them what Chardonnay varietal character looks like, that this is a great example. You know, I get that, um, you know, the apple, yeah. the citrus, green banana, pineapple. You know, I definitely get the apples for days on that and, mm -hmm. and all that. Green banana is a new one for me, but I can, I can see where you're getting with that. But it's bright, bright mm -hmm. fruit, fresh. Long finish, very full. You know, a big part of um, my winemaking as it's evolved over the years is I kind of went from the chalk talk, as you, you know, you come out of the university and you get all mm -hmm. this theory in your head, and then you become more of a cook. Right. More of a chef. Yeah. You know, and so your produce is, are the grapes. You know, so we're heavily involved in the grape growing. So you start thinking more like a plant physiologist. Mm -hmm. How are you going to develop the flavors in, the, in the, that fruit and that vineyard and so forth? Right. Um, so you're involved there, and then you bring it into your kitchen, which is the winery. Um, and then so you want those flare, uh, flavors to marry into this, you know, a, a mm -hmm. beautiful little package. Right. And in doing this, um, I approach it uh, 60, usually 60, 70% is barrel fermented. And what that does is the... Um, the barrel fermentation you have, and then we age it on the yeast. So the yeast are fermenting, the primary fermentation, and then they drop to the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, we stir once a week, get the yeast back up, and those yeast, after three or four months, they start to break apart. Okay. We call this autolysis. And a lot of the fatty acids and proteins in the yeast will actually dissolve into the wine. It helps give the wine a little bit more viscosity, okay. um, a little bit more flavor. And then some of those um, proteins will react with um, some of the tannin that was from the skins in the, in the wine and actually precipitate back out. Okay. So in a sense, it's, it's building up layers of flavor and then dropping out um, any tannins or, or harshness. Okay. Um, we were discussing like wine and all that in the car. And um, you know, I was trying to describe tannins and acid and preservative. And he had asked me, um, my father had asked me, like, what is tannin? And, I, and the only answer I'd come up with, well, it's, it's on the grape skins. It's, you know, and the this, yeah. that, and it's on tea leaves. But he asked, is it a chemical? I'm like, well, no, it's not a chemical, but it, it's not a protein. It, what, it, what is it? I it's don't a, really tannin, know. Tannin is a kind of a, a term for a, a whole large family of compounds. Okay. Um, that some of them are small, single um, uh, compound, molecule, okay. and then some of them are what we call dimers, they're hooked together, and okay. then some are multi-chain, you know, and they're actual structure components um, for the plants, Okay. You know, like lignin, or you know, the thing that makes this, the plants strong is um, based on tannins. and. And um, the where you get the tannins is in the from the skins mm -hmm. in general, right. and um, and a lot of the color is uh, comes from um, the skin, right? Yeah, yeah, the tannins, right? Yeah. Okay. So so tannins in general, when we talk about tannins, we talk about something that gives uh, some mouthfeel. They're important, mm -hmm. and particularly in red wines, give a little bit of backbone, a little bit of structure. Right. The smaller tannin compounds, um, the anthocyanins, they're responsible for color. Okay. Yeah. And right. so some of those anthocyanins will polymerize to some of the larger uh, tannin. Uh, we call them, well, they're phenolics. That's right. The yeah. Name. Phenolics, <laughs> which helps stabilize the color. Okay. So we're getting real geeky here. <laughs> well, that's, and, and, and if you haven't already figured out, the 1337 is a geek way to say leet, L E E T as in elite. So, so I'm all about the geek stuff, and that's kind of the history yeah. of the. The podcast is I saw a wine I thought was named 1337, so I thought someone named a wine for geeks, not necessarily wine geeks, and I found out it was 337, which yeah. actually was the first wine I reviewed um, yeah. uh, on the show because might as well just put it right out there that I'm not stealing the name, but that's where the name came from. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we were talking about 
uh, phenolic uh, ripeness and sugar levels and acid levels. And I, I try to explain it as best that I can. I mean, I'm not, I don't, not as knowledgeable about that. I, I kind of have a, you know, an understanding of it, but I had a hard time explaining the tannin part as to what it is. It's kind of like, well, it's just there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is. I mean, there, there's, I took a class in there today, day it was in it. I mean, it's it's there's a there's a book on phenolics. It's right. Like that that's big, right. Yeah. There is so many different variations. Right. Um, you know, the the smaller dimers, the, the, which two unit, they can cause bitterness. Okay. Um, but they can also cause color. You know. So it's right. kind of like, um, you know, it's difficult. I mean, you kind of have to experience it and right. understand what it is that you're doing and wine making to mm -hmm. um, appreciate. I think as consumers, we just we want that color, we want that mouth feel, we want that structure. Right. And we don't want bitterness, we want right. length to finish. You know, so it's, as a winemaker, you're always walking that fence to get it just right. Right. Well, um, yeah, and, and you know, I didn't get too far in chemistry, I just took it in high school, but it, I, all the stuff you said at least made sense. So, so um, if someone yeah. at least took high school chemistry, I think they should at least, those, those terms at least stuck with me <laughs> so well it wasn't, also, it wasn't too too bad <laughs> they could also send me a note at Fremark Abbey and maybe I can answer their questions if right. anybody's interested um, so back to the wine like you know it has uh, all the apples I mean it's this is um, typically my preferred style Chardonnay I don't drink a whole lot of Chardonnay but it's my typical um, preference is is this it doesn't have that buttered popcorn type of thing. Right. And I'm not saying that I don't like any of that. I, it, it has its place and there are times I'm like, this is good and I like it. Um, but if I had to decide on a Chardonnay style, then this would be it. Um, well, I, I think this style lends itself better with food as, as like a balancing act. If you have something that's overblown, too oaky, um, or the malolactic where it's too buttery, the, um, it'll stand out. It might even clash, not mm -hmm. really complement the your plate. Um, you know, the other thing I mentioned, not too oaky. Uh, you know, we'd use a certain amount of new oak. Right. And for me, uh, new oak is adding the spice to a wine. Mm -hmm. um, Again, you know, chef, chef fresh, you know. You know, you're going to get um, uh, aromas of like uh, vanilla, Mm -hmm. cinnamon, uh, clove, right. um, nutmeg, mm -hmm. uh, some different uh, kinds of um, compounds that will add. So if you have too much of that new oak, then it overpowers the wine, right. overpowers that fruit. Right. Yeah, I mean, this. I think this is really good. Um, it's got a good balance of that. The acid is really great. Um, you know, it's. I, I agree, you know, definitely a food wine. I mean, most wines, I think, we're going to say are are best with food. I mean, there are some wines that taste really good that you can just drink on their own and they're fine. Um, you know, I've, I've experienced some wines, you know, where I, I've decided that the wine was good, but it would be much better if I had food with it. So if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm doing an evaluation of the wine, you know, sometimes I'm, I struggle with saying, well, I couldn't really necessarily just sit down and drink this bottle. Whereas other wines, I'm like, if I had food with it, then yeah, absolutely, it would be much better. Yeah. Um, and you know this wine though I could totally just drink on its own. I think yeah. white wines in general are easier anyway to do yeah, that. Yeah, this could go either way. Now, yeah. You can have it with a you know, complimented dinner, or if you just want to have a glass, something refreshing, um, this works. It's very nice. I, I like it a lot, and uh, it's my, my first time trying it, so um, yeah. that's good. Um, some of these other wines I've had in the past, so um, but uh, it's, it's it'll be good to revisit them too. So sure. um, awesome, let's go move on to wine number two. Okay, well wine number two is the 2001 Cabernet Sauvignon from Fremark Abbey. Okay. And I picked this one because I, I, I believe Morton's is, uh, has it on the list right now. Yes. And um, uh, you know, so I thought it would be kind of fun to talk about it and, uh, and to taste it. Um, 2001, so what we're looking at, Math-wise, 13 years old? Yeah, 13 years. Yeah, Not 13. really no sediment on it. Um, no, you know, and, it, and it's, yeah, and it's still showing a, a fairly decent color. Right. Um, and actually, this, I, mean, this, it's, I think this is a good opportunity to kind of look at the colors. I mean, I know this isn't a pure white background, but, I mean, you can see that there's a, a marked difference. I'm assuming this is a, the one or three is a much newer vintage yeah. um, compared to one. I mean, if you were looking at both of these, um, 
you know, you can definitely see that if I was in a, if I was in a situation where I was going through the blinds um, and I needed to kind of help determine age, uh, especially with red wines, I think it's for me, it's easier with red wines. Plus with testing, I don't tend to get extremely old white wines, but that you could, but you could, that right off the bat would tell me that I'm dealing with wine that's older. Um, you know, it doesn't have, it's not as purple, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's got that red and they, they tell us to stay away from the brick. Uh, the brick analogy because brick comes in all types of colors but that reddish brick you know almost a little bit of you know brownish to it so yeah a little bit more garnet yeah yeah and then and then you know this this wine I'll tell you a little bit about the source um, pr predominantly from Rutherford okay uh, from 2001 um, and I don't remember the percentages but I certainly would have used uh, some Merlot and some Petit Verdot Right. And uh, in blending into this to make it a Bordeaux variety. Or Bordeaux blend, I should say. So I get some plums and some, mm -hmm. um, you know, earthiness, a little bit of, um, for me, it, it's like, um, I could definitely tell that this wine has a little bit of age to it. I might get a little, uh, like, new shoe leather. Okay, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, new shoe leather. Um, like a little cherry pie that's been sitting out for a week. <laughs> right, because I, because you're, you're talking about plum and I can get that kind of, that sweetness, that almost decaying type of yeah. of aroma from, from plum, so more like prune, you know, get into the, into the prune side of things. Yeah, and then it has that, you know, like I mentioned, like, you know, the, like a cherry pie, but something's been sitting out Right. So you have that smell of the the bread. I mean, or the the crust mm -hmm. and the in the pie and the the um, the juice of the cherries, and it's all kind of aging as it's been sitting out on the uh, countertop for a week, and um, so it, it's a kind of a progression of aromas. It's, it's also get a little bit of a tobacco forest floor. I get that. A little bit of clove. I get that a lot, yeah. Yeah. I get I get definitely the spiciness out of it and um, mm -hmm. uh, the plum and the cherry pie. And then when you taste this, it has that, you know, kind of a cherry plum taste to it. The tannins are fairly resolved. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a fairly crisp finish. Yeah, it doesn't. The tannins initially don't don't hit you too hard, but they're still there. I mean, I still feel a bit of dryness, you know, on the yeah. gums, but it's not it's not something that's going to just hit me in the face. And and you know, it's not like we decanted these wines, or at least not. You know, this was pretty much just popped and poured, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's not. It doesn't. It's not like we need to sit there and, and decant it. Um, but I mean, and on the palate, it's you know, like like I said, we're talking about that 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 kind of sweetness on on the nose with with the plum, uh, the prunish. But I don't. It's not as. It's not like it tastes like that. You know, I don't get that. I don't get that that sweetness from it from the like the aroma. Um, it's definitely. Um, uh, I would say, well, it's dry, but I mean, but it, it doesn't have it doesn't have a it does it doesn't smell like it like it doesn't taste like it smells yeah. necessarily. So, because on the nose, it's there's almost there was almost like a it's kind of, I don't really want to say there's a port quality to it, but it had that that quality where when you taste it, you might think, oh, this is going to taste sweet, um, and it doesn't. This this is um, also with those refined tannins. Um, this wine would go particularly well with um, uh, like a filet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you don't need, you, you're not necessarily gonna want to put this with with a highly marbled steak, um, yeah. because the steak's gonna overpower the wine. This is definitely something that you're gonna want with 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 a dish that isn't, isn't going to be uh, bold, you know, you definitely want something like like a fillet would, yeah. would be would, is, is, is an excellent is an excellent um, yeah. pairing for that. Absolutely, uh, it's really good, really good, and okay. uh, I've had some good feedback on it too. So oh great, so now uh, jumping into 2012. Okay, 
This is the Merlot. So now we're dealing with a youngster. Right. That wants to get up out of the chair and run around the room. There you go. And color-wise, I should have I should have suspected this was more Merlot than Cab. Yeah. Uh, it's probably about 85% Merlot. Merlot? Okay. Something like that. I never remember. You make too many wines and they, you know, I, I, I don't remember the, the different... Uh, Ratios of, of what we used, you know, and then, you know, we always do these blend tri uh, bench trials before right. we put the wine together, and we come up with what we want to use, and, and then we put it together in the cellar and then bottle it. And how long of a process is that? I mean, does it take you a long time to figure out what blend you want, um, or sometimes it's just it, you it, hit the right one and you, it pretty quickly? You know, you, you right after harvest, you know, you're, you're tasting all the new wines and you're kind of getting some ideas of what's you know what's going to make the team and what's not, mm -hmm. you know, and um, or where you're going to put that in this, you know. So you start um, like I create my little binder of the different lots that I possibly want to use in the Merlot. And, uh, and my binder has all my different products. And, and then in the end, toward the end of barrel aging, you start doing some blending trials. Okay. And so you do it several times um, before you, you know, come up with what you really think is um, uh, gonna hit the ball out of the park. So um, I, I think this is really a nice expression of Merlot. It's, it's um, you know, in, my world today, and with the Jackson family ownership, they bring to the table some new vineyards for me to play with. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the Howe Mountain Vineyard, um, which is the Keys Vineyard. Um, a lot of Merlot up there. I, I pulled some mm -hmm. of that Merlot into this product. Um, I get Merlot from uh, Stagecoach or with Atlas Peak area. Okay. And then a chunk of Merlot from Rutherford. Mm -hmm that'll all go into here um, and blend in some Cabernet to kind of give it a little bit more depth, a little bit more structure to it. Okay. A um, little bit of Petit Verdot. Um, and uh, we, were, we were up at Howl Mountain yesterday um, and uh, so it was cool to, to see all that. And I mean, I could look at a map all day long, but driving through the area really helps kind of put things in perspective. Um, yeah. But, um, so you've got you've got the Howl Mountain, you've got the Rutherford, you've got you said Atlas Peak. Um, Atlas Peak be south, yeah. Right. Yeah. So what what do each of those areas really bring to the Merlot? You know, it, it yeah, good question. Um, the Howl Mountain, it's uh, typically small berry, very concentrated. Okay. Um, uh, to me, it's dark cherry. Um, the Atlas Peak is. Um, a little more uh, briary, uh, a little bit more sage. Okay. A little spicy, distinctive sage things going on in it. Um, Rutherford, uh, again, gets to the dark cherry, blackberry um, genre um, in general. Well, on the nose, I was getting a lot of the, um, I get a lot of blue fruit, but it was, there was a little bit of plum but I got a lot a lot of bluish fruit um, and then when I when I taste it I still get that but I definitely get that briary type of um, mm -hmm. uh, feeling on the palate and um, you know pretty good tannin I mean it's I would if I had to evaluate the tannin I would say it's probably in a medium plus range and almost high um, you know being young I'm sure this will after a couple more years will start settling down a little bit more yeah Merlot always, to me, this is the mostly cherries, plums, dark fruit, kind mm -hmm. of darkish um, or bluish, is what you were saying. Um, um, Merlot also typically has kind of an arugula, a rocket salad aroma. Hmm. It's just one of the varietal characters of it, and I just get that as a little nuance. But I, I think that gives it some, you know, certainly part of the complexity that helps it. Um, uh, mash with a lot of different foods. Right. This is aged for well, probably about 14 months. Okay. In a combination of French and American oak. Um, then, like I said, it's 2012. It's our new release. 
This is very nice. And and how long do you think this this for ageability? You think you know, do you think you think uh, you know there'd be a there'd be like the equivalent of a two thousand one on the cab side of this or? Yeah, no, I, I think it would uh, certainly age um, fifteen years, perhaps more. You know, that, you know good seller. You have an abundance of fruit, buns, uh, great depth of flavor there. You have uh, crisp acidity, mm -hmm. which is also important for ageability. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things we were talking about in the car. That you know, white wine is mostly about the acid. Yeah. But red wine, and I, I kind of emphasize the tannin so much, but I even said an acid too. I mean, you got high acid, high tannin. You, you've got at least potential. I mean, it doesn't guarantee anything, obviously, but yeah. you just have some potential for ageability that can it can really go pretty long and still be tasting good. Yeah. Um, and I think I think when we talk about red wines, I think a lot of times we forget that acid is just as important as tannin, or I'm assuming just as important, you know, uh, is tannin to, for the ageability of the red wine. Well, it absolutely is, um, you know, because the acid uh, decreases with age. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to actually have something to stand up in your cellar for a while, it needs to be, have uh, some, you know, it can't be flabby from the get-go. It right. needs to have a little bit of a crisp finish. And that, I think that that also helps it, um, the length in your mouth, right? the length of flavor. Um, and then, you know, I prefer a crisper side than a soapy side. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's just my own preference. Right. Yeah. Well, we all have our preferences, right? Yeah. And I mean, in this Merlot, I mean, I really like it. It's, I mean, it, it's got a good fruit. Um, it's got, it's got a good fruit characteristic to it. Um, but then that's, at the, that's really at the beginning. And then as it, as it goes, as it gets, you know, to the back part of the palate, it, it settles down. It, it becomes a little more mineral. It's, it's I mean, it's. No one's gonna. No one's gonna um, uh, mistake this for. I don't think it was a mistake for a cab, um, and it's not. It, no one's gonna mistake this for old world. It doesn't. It doesn't have. You know, doesn't have tons of earthiness or anything to it. You know, it's definitely a, a fruit forward uh, Merlot. It drinks really nice. It's got some good tannin structure to it. You know, whereas this 2001, yeah, you probably don't want to go too much higher than a filet. You could sit there and and go ribeye with this. I mean, I yeah. think it stands up plenty. Right. Where you could you could really pair it with that and, and fatty your foods um, yeah. when you start getting into that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I like it a lot. I like yeah. it a lot. Thank you. All right, and then uh, we're going to this last one here. Getting into the cab. So um, I, I heard you talking about or was, 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 was the, or the, the wines that are over there, right? Right. Okay. The, the off-camera wines. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the end of the table. I'm going to bring bring onto the table for you <laughs> something special. All right. So what do we have right here? This is our 2011 Cabernet okay. Sauvignon from Free, right. from Free Market Abbey. Now you know you can you smell that and it's like oh that's Cabernet. Yeah. <laughs> totally different. A um, little more to me is a little bit more earthy, uh, mm -hmm. dried cherry. Um, you know, I can tell you one thing that, that really hit me first, which I was I was a little bit shocked, but there was there was a mint. And yeah. it, it really it, it was like and I I've, I've I've smelled mint plenty of times in wines, okay? But I've never had where I it took me to like, you know, really spearmint gum. It was just like it just was really just a little bit different. Um, yeah. Yeah, this it's it's very distinctive. I get um, a little bit of chili pepper. Um, I mean, this is uh, a, a great example of Cabernet varietal character, uh, particularly in a cool growing season. Right. Now, I, I keep hearing about that 2011 was a little bit of a challenge up here. That um, was yeah, it was. It was um, you know, but like I tell the guys, you know, it's like well, it's our opportunity to. Make a silk purse out of a salisbury. You know, we, you know, we had some vineyards that um, we had rain basically. Mm -hmm. You know, for the people, the viewers out there, we had um, a lot of rain right at harvest time, and um, and we had to really jump into action to save some fruit, save some vineyards, and uh, pull out all the stops to make a great wine. Okay, and so when when that happens, when it was raining during during harvest time, are you? Or you know there's a threat of rain. Are you trying to harvest early? Do you? Well, you, I mean, how, what, you know what. Basically, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you prioritize, and 
you know, you know that you can't do it all, you know, in the right. same day. So, uh, what's the most ripe? Bring that in first, and then, you know, what's starting to get hurt? You bring that in, you know. So, you, so then you start dealing with the different uh, problems that you see to mm -hmm. to make them right. Right. Um, so that I think this is a great example of, of pulling something out of the hat that that really works. Now that, again, I think this would go really well with a ribeye. Mm -hmm. Good balance, dark cherry, dried dried cranberries, mint. Yeah, I mean the on on the structure too. I mean the tannins are definitely high tannins. Um, you got good acidity with it too. My mouth's watering a lot. Besides the fact that what you're talking about food, I mean that already is going to get the juices going, but. Um, you know the 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 whole structure of it is something that you know definitely needs something you know larger than than some type of fillet. Um, you need you needs or or if you're gonna have a fillet, you need to have like some type of butter, like um, melted butter type of thing on top of it. Something that gives that extra bit of fat content uh, or a sauce like a Bernays sauce or a hollandaise sauce. Something that's gonna coat the steak. Um, and, and really add to the add to that fat structure rather than just you know straight up I, I'm having a, a fillet or a sirloin and there's not not as much fat to it so you really got to do that. Yeah. Um, I joke with people a lot about um, sauces you know they 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 like to poo poo about uh, putting a one on a steak and I'm like well we we put peppercorn sauce on steaks. I mean if, if I have my if I have my choices a one is not going to be my top choice. Right. But. There's something about the flavor of that that you know steak sauces exist for a reason, and um, if somebody wants a one on their steak, I'm not gonna I'm not going to um, tell them that they're they're stupid and they should have some other sauce. But I mean, we put other sauces on steaks to enhance them. Yeah. But um, I'm not saying I would use a one with this. But uh, you know, if you had like a Bernays or a Hollandaise sauce or something like like yeah. a, some type of butter that you put on there. I mean, this would also be great, like with um, sausages. Yeah. Some, um, you know, like a smoky uh, Dakota brats. Or even some brisket, some barbecue type stuff. Oh yeah. Um, because you'll get, you get the pepperiness combined with this. I think it'd be a really good combination. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's great. Very nice. Um, all these wines are, are spectacular. Um, you know, I really appreciate uh, you guys spending some time with me. I know, I know, harvest is always the most difficult time, and then after harvest, like you said, there's get a nice, nice little break. But there's still a lot going on in the winery. I mean, it's yeah. you've got the you know the fermentation after the fermentation, getting everything to the barrels and all that. So there's still a lot of activity that's happening this time of year. Uh, in the valley versus if I showed up like in December or January, um, but um, uh, you know I really appreciate the uh, the extra time that you guys took to uh, to spend with me. Well, I, and I'm happy, and I got a couple of treats for you. Okay, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll have to get, get go over there. All right. Well, let me so unplug so here. I can, or you can unplug there. Uh, you can go grab there. those wines. Yep. And uh, while you're while he's grabbing the wines, I'll put these off to the side. I'm gonna kind of finish this 2001 there. Um, so while, while he's getting all the, while uh, Ted's getting all the wines, um, just want to go through. So this week we're, we've got quite a few wineries to hit. Uh, I've got another one we're doing today. And um, so every week we'll have a new winery. Um, it'll take approximately six weeks to um to get to, through all of these so um besides the thanksgiving christmas and new year's episodes so we're, we're going to go into january this this episode actually be the first one so when i get back to san antonio um it'll either be a week from no it won't be a week from yesterday it'll be either be uh in two weeks or in three weeks it just depends on how much time i've got when i get back to edit um but uh um we've got we have plenty of episodes here so, uh, what I have for you, uh, Freemark Abbey, one of the, it's on the forefront of 
this thing uh, that people are doing a lot now is um, vineyard designates. Right. Um, in fact, the first glass on your left is called Cabernet Boucher. Okay. And uh, what that means, uh, I mean, I got there in the marketplace. People ask me, I was like, oh, I never heard of that variety before. I was like, well, that's a good question. Um, it's actually Cabernet Sauvignon from okay. the Beauchet family vineyard. All right. A small vineyard on the Rutherford bench. Um, Fremark Abbey started doing it in 1970. We were a handshake agreement with John Beauchet that we'd take all his fruit um, from 1970 on. Oh, wow. Um, and Arguably, it's one of the first vineyard designates in California's history. I mean, Heights Martha's, I think, started in 67, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, uh, anyway, it's been a calling card for us in many marketplaces. We do typically 1,000, 1,500 cases of it. Okay. Um, and I blend from the vineyard. I have Merlot there. I blend in um, anywhere from 8 to 15% Merlot to make this uh, Bordeaux blend. Okay. This is 2010, by the way. 2010, all right. Yeah. This I was going to ask, but I thought maybe you'd already told me. I was like, well, maybe I'll just discreetly look at the bottle, but yeah, 2010, all right. Yeah. This is one of my long ball hitters. No, that gives me goosebumps. When I got out of the university, I wanted to make Cabernet. Right. And, and this is what this is this the. Is, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm loving it. Dark cherry. Yeah, I'm getting the red fruits, the dark fruits, more mint. Um, not yeah. not the Wrigley spearmint this time. More of just like a, just a straight up mint. And there's some green olive, um, tobacco, uh, cinnamon clove. Yeah, I can I can see the olive now. Yeah, yeah. Our suggestion off. is great, you know, when you're, when you, well, but when you're like, so talking with dad's over here, by the way. Uh, so when, when dad's sitting there going, I don't smell any of this. I don't taste any of this. Well, you know, and, and a lot of it because he, he doesn't drink as much as I do. I'm not saying I'm an alcoholic, just doesn't taste as much wine as I do. Um, and some of it is practice makes perfect, but tasting with other people, saying olive right there, you know, I was like, I'm getting stuff in here. And then sometimes it's, it's so, for me, it's subtle. Yeah. So you're olive, and you're specifically green olive, you're kind of like, yeah, that's what I get. And that's kind of how you practice, you know, drinking with other people, tasting wine with other people helps you um, pick up on some of those nuances that maybe like, you know, not that green olives are not part of, part of my background. They are. Um, I don't eat a lot of green olives. I eat a lot of black olives because um, it's just, just a preference of mine. But, um, but some people key into things a little bit more than others. But I totally, can, I totally can see where you're getting the green olive on yeah. that. And yesterday we were walking around and I was, uh, I forgot, you remember which one we were at? I said something about olives, to smell olives? Uh, it would have been probably Ladera, I guess. Ladera. Ladera, okay. Because um, I don't, we went to Montalena, Ladera, and Gergich. Well, Gergich was more just go to the tasting room. Um, and I think it was Ladera, I, I thought I, I didn't even ask if they had any olives on, on the property, but it, I smelled olive. You yeah, know? yeah. So I don't know if it was from fermentation or from, which I think most of the stuff has already been fermented. Um, so I don't know if it was just olive trees are in the area and on, on Howe Mountain and I just was picking up on it, but. You know, you, you, we talk about descriptors and stuff like that. And that's something that, um, that we do in wine appreciation. Uh, and we learned, you know, I learned back at the university that you try to talk about something that that you perceive and it's objective and you can say that and you can communicate to whoever it is that you're having a conversation with. I, I remember one student uh, in our sensory evaluation class say, oh, this smells like mockingbirds singing out the window my, when I wake <laughs> up in the morning. And the, the instructor said, like, what do you mean? Right. Like that was so subjective. Are you saying you smell stale sheets or, you know, and yeah, like yeah. mockingbirds singing? You cannot smell <laughs> mockingbirds singing. You know, but if you can say, I smell, you know, dark cherries and, right. you know, plums and stuff, then people understand. Yeah. The, my most, I, my, the, the description I have that, and it's usually with Italian wines, um, that is 
as you know, personal is, as I call it, accordion case. But then I explain what accordion case is. It's leather, dust, and felt. Uh, you know, because oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's his accordion case. Right, right. <laughs> in the garage, you know, growing up, yeah. it had the dust, and sure. he'd play the accordion, it would smell, and that's... You it, get that leather it, smells? Yeah. That's probably pretty nice. Yeah, so, so Italian wines, if I get that combination, then I'm pretty much, in a blind especially, but I'm pretty much like, this is Italy, and it's hard for me to get out of that mindset, because sometimes French wines will give me that too. The you know, southern French wines, Rhone type of stuff. Every once in a while I'll get that element, but it's not as distinctive. And not every Italian wine gives me that. So, you know, yeah. I've had Italian wines that, you know, didn't have any hint of that. But when I get that, then I'm kind of like, I, I've already made my decision from just the aroma, which can be dangerous, that uh, I'm dealing with Italy. And then I go through the whole process and I try to pigeonhole everything into Italy. And then at the end, I find out that, no, you're drinking southern Rhone. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I messed up. So, this is nice, by the way. What's it's interesting nice. is when just about a mile and a quarter south of there. So that so this is on the the Rutherford Bench, um, right up against the Mayacamas. Uh, you go a mile and a half, a mile and a quarter south of there, also against the Mayacamas. Soil is different. Mm -hmm. Boche is very gravelly. The soil at Sycamore Vineyard, which is our next class, is um, more has more clay content. Um, it's kind of a two feet of gravelly clay loam and then it hits a hard pan clay. Um, we used to have Sauvignon Blanc there, it did really well. Uh, we tried Cabernet and it's been fantastic, which is interesting. Um, but, it, but it is different. So now if you, you smell the Boucher and then smell the Sycamore, then I'm going to give you a suggestion, is that you're going to get more black currant. You go from dark cherry to black currant mm -hmm. and dark chocolate. I even get more spices out of this too. Yeah. Kind of like a almost cinnamon and potpourri. But it, it's it's interesting because this is almost more like a mountain wine, awful like Mount Veter. Right. Okay. It, it, okay. It, it's darker in color. Uh, it typically has more tannin structure. Black currant. And this is of more clay, right? Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do a shot in the dark on my knowledge of soil and grapes. Cabernet isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily like clay as much as Merlot, right? Yes, no, or am well, I just completely off well, base? Well, I'm not sure about the comparison with Merlot, but in general, you would not think to plant Cabernet in a, in a clay. heavily clay area. Okay. This is really um, good, though. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, it is. You yeah. know, it's an anomaly. You know, so sometimes you have to throw the rules out the door. Right. You know, but this, it's on a slope mm -hmm. right up to the Mike so I think it's a little bit elevated. So um, it gets good drainage? It, you know, yeah. And, and it's, it's different. It's basically, both of these are basically dry farmed. Um, but you can take clay soil out by the Napa River, and it's just too heavy, and Cabernet doesn't do well there. Mm -hmm. But for some reason or other, this is blessed land. The Sycamore Vineyard from Fremark Abbey is fantastic. They're, they're both excellent. Um, and you mean, yeah, the tannins are, are killing it. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> they're killing it in a good yeah, way. I mean, huh? it's balanced. Yeah. You know, oh, they're, yeah, yeah. They're, they're resolved. They're not like, you know, yeah. it's... it's they're there, but you're, you know, but both of these are gonna, you know, you're probably gonna want a porterhouse or. A <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you definitely need, you definitely need something to, to. These are, these are not, these are not wines you just sit on a porch and drink. Uh, you just, I mean, you could if you really wanted to, but this is something you have to have food with. Um, yeah, yeah, it begs, begs for, yeah, begs for food. I mean, it's. Or cheese. I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah, if you had some cheese, you know, that kind of counterbalances that. Right. Um, and with the um, with the the Boucher, that last little sip I had, more so than than with the Sycamore, though I think it was a little bit there. 
I got a little bit of that that green pepper near the very end. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, so another one of those things that you know oh, I, yeah, yeah. I, I tend to like that in, in cabs. You know, I think we all have preferences and, and flavors and aromas that we have, and for some reason I, I really like to key in on if if I get that that pepper. But it is a part of the varietal character. Kind yeah. Of well, sometimes, and, sometimes when and, wines these are made, you don't get it. Yeah, well, if you allow your fruit to hang for a really, really long time, mm-hmm. you're going to get more black fruit and less of that, you know, the, okay. the pepper, chili pepper or, or green pepper, whatever that is. Right. Um, but you also get higher alcohol and you also get more raisiny or pruning. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you're always walking that fence in winemaking. Um, a lot of my colleagues like the riper style. Freemark has always been on the uh, more the moderate. I mean, okay. we're, not, we're not really extremely ripe. Right. You know, I like, I, you know, for break, for people that know about bricks, I'm, you know, in that ballpark of 24 and a half to 25 and a half degrees bricks. And, you know, I'm out there in the vineyard tasting the fruit. I'm looking at the seeds to see the maturity in the seeds. You mm-hmm. walk in the vineyard. So you kind of get a feeling for the ripeness and the development of the flavors. Right. And that's what I go for. Um, you know, a lot of people are hanging the fruit out there a long, long time, trying to get black, just get, right. all, get all black. And mm-hmm. I think, well, no, you know, it's okay to have some of that, a little bit of that green. Green, yeah. That's, that's part of the varietal character. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just, I mean, really, just there's all these, all these wineries out here, and, and they all have their, you know, their their take on what they want to do. Um, yeah. You know, and and that's their preference, and there's people out there that are going to like that, you know, and I mean. There's, there's definitely. I think there's a place for all these styles of wines. You know, if if you if you want that, that fruity, um, plumish type of cab, then then it's there. If you want something that's more green character, it's you know that you're gonna be able to find that too. Um, I'm I'm lucky that because of how I do all this, I, I just I just buy wine. I just you know because either I just buy whatever it is, and so I've, I'm exposed I think to more different wines. Um, because of doing all these reviews and, and, and coming out to places like this um, than your typical consumer that they kind of key in on I like that and then they just keep buying that yeah. and you know I think my my goal is to is to get people to say hey you know you might want to try something different um, because I, I tend to go for the different the interesting the unusual to me you know may, or new to me it may not be new to other people they may be like dude I've been seeing that wine forever I've been drinking it well I hadn't you know, and there's, there's there's a discovery part that I think is really nice with with wine. Um, one of one of the things you know, one of one of wine is one of those things where having that discovery is is really great. Even if somebody else has already discovered it, it's still a discovery for you. Um, and I, I thank you for uh, for the extra little treat here. These these were wonderful. Absolutely, I really enjoyed it. Um, we're gonna go and wrap things up um, uh, again, Ted. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me. Um, folks, as always, uh, I just want to thank everyone for stopping by. Um, I'll have I'll have a link below for the uh, winery, uh, so stop by the website for that. Um, of course, uh, got the links above to friend me up, and then not pointing at Ted, but there's there's this little button over there if you want to uh, hit hit the PayPal button and send send a couple ducats. You don't have to, but you know it's always nice. Um, and um, we have a lot more wineries to do. And uh, we will see everyone again next time.